Hello, everyone. Uh, we have uh, several people uh, joining the webinar here as we speak. So um, just a couple more minutes and we will get started with the December chapter meeting for the CSI next chapter. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Ogg, CSI Next Chapter President for 2022-2023 fiscal with uh, the Construction Specifications Institute. Uh, very happy that you have joined us today for the December chapter meeting, uh, which is being presented to us today by the Architectural Woodwork Institute, um, Care and Storage of Woodwork, the AWI Standard 200. And um, our presenter today is Margaret Fisher. And uh, for those of you that uh, were members of this chapter last year, uh, if you attended the AWI presentation <clears throat> on the uh, standard from last year, you know that uh, this is gonna be a, a really informative and uh, detailed presentation with a lot of, a lot of good information. Uh, so we hope you enjoy it. And before we get started, um, We'd just like to thank our many chapter sponsors that, that help make these programs possible and allow CSI Next to uh, be the chapter that it is. Uh, Architectural Woodwork Institute, uh, AWI, Margaret, thank you for your continued support and your presentation today. Uh, National Gypsum, uh, ADIS, CAM Architectural Consultants, Northern Facades, and Daniel Hargreaves. Again, thank you for all of your continued support, and uh, we hope that you continue to support us in the future. Uh, because with none of none of your support, uh, this would this would not be possible. So, um, at this point in time, I will turn it over to Margaret Fisher, our presenter for today, uh, who is going to talk to us about the care and storage of woodwork, the AWI Standard 200 for care and storage. Um, you, during the presentation, if you have questions, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A uh, option. Please put your questions uh, into there. Uh, we'll tabulate them, and then uh, at the end of the presentation, we will go through and get as many answered as we can. Uh, those that we don't get answered, uh, we will make sure that we follow up with you directly uh, after the presentation is over, um, and you will also receive uh, AIA and HW or HSW credit for this presentation as well. So uh, with that being said, uh, Margaret, uh, thank you again for, for being a chapter sponsor and presenting to us today and the stage is yours. All right. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I had a little cold, so I had a little trouble with my throat. So if you have a hard time understanding me, that's, that's all my fault. Please uh, try to let uh, somebody know so that I can do something about it. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the standard 200 care and storage. This used to be one of the sections of the great big AWI standards book. And of course, all of our uh, standards are now individual topics because they are largely ANSI standards. Three of them will not be ANSI standards. This is one of them, but we still needed to break it out. That being said, this information applies to everything woodwork. So we're talking about materials that are actually installed on the interior of the building. That's what we're talking about, not stuff that's outside. So let's uh, get into it here. Let's see if I can remember how to rotate the slides. There we go. The materials are copyrighted. I am not at liberty to share the presentation with anybody, so you might as well not even bother asking me. And um, we are registered providers, uh, G003 of the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems. And of course, we try to upgrade our uh, learning opportunities as new things uh, happen and change within the standards. We have other programs as well. As you know, um, there's never any reason to have a monthly meeting without a program. See me, we probably have something we haven't covered with you yet. Uh, if you have a, you know, quick, we need a program situation. I'm going to uh, tell you that our learning objectives are what you probably already saw. So you're going to learn how to use the architectural woodwork standards to support job site conditions um, and uh, the requirements and specifications for that. The, uh, understand how interior environment impacts the properties and characteristics of wood products. Gain specific knowledge about job site conditions that keep woodwork stable and understand where the responsibility lies for woodwork stability and maintenance. And I know you know what we're talking about there. Everybody wants to know whose fault it is, right? So uh, we are going to cover that. The information we share today comes from AWI's new standard um, 200 care and storage. 
Come on. Yeah, there we go. All right. So um, what you're used to seeing uh, is the old uh, toolbox, our old standards, which was, you know, this large book that's, you know, 700 pages long or something like that. And of course, we don't have that anymore. So you're looking for the individual standards. And because the new uh, section that's just about care and storage is an individual standard. It's that pink one that you see up in the upper right-hand corner. That thing is really only about nine pages long. It's the same information that was in the uh, care and uh, storage section of the old standards, but it has been updated to accommodate information as the standards are now used globally. You know, this does apply around the world. So when we think about, you know, using standards to help protect yourself in a situation, this is something that, it, you know, we don't ask you to sit down and read a whole standards, but I'll tell you what, if you skim it, you're going to know where the information is. So when the question comes up on a project, why is this happening? Who should we be talking to about it, et cetera? It's really good to know what's in the standard. So please take a moment. You can go right online to the AWI website and you can pull up that standard and you can look at that digitally online. You don't have to buy it. And you can read that and, or skim it at least and know what kinds of things are in there. So when the question comes up, you have a place to reach for. You have a place to go quickly that helps you know you know, what are the characteristics and properties? What should be happening? How should it have happened? What do we do next? Though the information is, is in the standard. This is one of your best friends. It's one of your best tools. So why do we want to detail and specify architectural woodwork um, according to AWI standards? You know, it's important because for you, it's preventive medicine. Standards helps everybody speak the same language, the customer, the architect, the general contractor, the interior designer, the estimator, the project manager, the building owner. Um, everybody will interpret an idea different ways. And I think this um, sh slide shows you, you know, this is, you've seen this happen on job sites, right? So the AWA standards, of course, is the voice of sanity in reason that helps you accurately convey your true expectations for the job. And it helps to protect everybody on the job. So whether your project, you know, that you're responsible for looks something like this, you know, or like this, or like this, you know, the standards apply equally to all project types. And so that will help to determine the ultimate success of your project. <clears throat> so, Oh man, I got to keep clearing my throat. I'm so sorry. I just, I wish I hadn't had a cold. It's really kind of troubling that this is happening. But, um, you know, keep in mind that this, a Karen, a Karen store standard is a, is a place to begin. And it's also your leg to stand on. If there's some kind of a, you know, dispute about how somebody thinks something is that's beyond what happens for general good practice in installation. Remember that this protects you. Um, and, and one of the reasons that this is such an important thing is that you wouldn't probably believe it, but more than 75% of the questions that come as calls or emails to AWI is about this topic. So this is a, a pretty big deal. All right, so to make it easier, uh, to navigate the complex and unique world of custom architectural woodwork and planning, you know, the standard 200 helps you find, um, you know, the useful information easily in the table of contents on page IV, which is page four. So there's so much information in the nine pages that make up the standard. We're only going to touch on the most important things that help your project go smoothly, keep you out of trouble, you know, along the way. So in the next few slides, we'll take a look at those critical elements that make a project a success. So let's go directly to the table of contents. You know, and keep in mind that the first job of an AWI member um, is to provide a quality product that does not fail. 
And uh, we don't actually have that written anywhere in our work. It's like the unspoken truth that we all recognize is this is why people are a member of the Architectural Woodwork Institute is that this is the thing that hangs above us, that we are bound to provide a quality product that does not fail. And so the vast 70 years of experience of AWI woodworkers, you know, has been compiled into uh, these books that answer, you know, the questions about, you know, what makes it so. How does it become a quality product that does not fail? So the great roadmap uh, that is the table of contents shows you how to get directly to the area of concern quickly when something comes up. And that's whether you're planning it or whether you're reviewing a project that's already installed. Uh, you'll notice that the dimensional change responsibility items, uh, that's near the top in the general requirements. This is going to be one of the very first things that comes up when you're talking about, you know, expectations in specifications. And why is that? Because there are expectations, not just with the delivery of the product and the installation of the product, but its use long term. What happens six months later? What happens a year later? The standard applies to all that. This is a little bit like, you know, when you go to a restaurant, you know, and you're looking at the menu, somebody gave you a recommendation what they liked, how it was tasty, the service was good, the atmosphere was great and all that. You order something off the menu, you get the description and the recommendation from the, the waitress and then you order it and it should be just as you expected. And that's really how, you know, you should uh, have your expectations for architectural woodwork as well. And that's why we have standards. So, you know, what is the purpose of the AWA Standard 200? These are the requirements for the proper conditions necessary to protect architectural woodwork and related interior finishes from the negative effects of temperature, relative humidity, and handling. It also defines who is responsible for care and the interior environment conditions before, during, and after installation. It is a long process. Please note that the requirements of standard 200 apply to all aesthetic grades, whether it's economy, custom, or premium grade. Yes, while the standards have changed, these three grades have not changed. They are the same. So no matter where your project is located, no matter the grade, the standard applies to all of that. So page uh, two expressly informs the specifier that the responsibility of standard 200 requirements plus the environmental conditions shall be maintained by the owner after installation. So right away, you know where you go. How did the owner decide to maintain that after it was installed? So we're talking about occupancy. We're going to get that um, in, a, you know, in just a minute uh, as we go along, but for now, let's look at some causes of our most common woodwork problems. So in order to do that, let's take a look at what's going on with a tree because that is where it all starts. Compare the cut end of a tree you know, that we get lumber from to the cut end of a baguette. If you cut through each, you'll see open cells that can absorb water, whether that's a mist or whether that's solid water. Okay, if you let the ends of these two things sit in water, they would absorb the moisture like a sponge. Lumber and other wood materials are kiln dried to six to eight percent moisture content. That is what the woodworker is starting with. That's pretty dry, but that's the level that it needs to be at in order to maintain the dimensional stability of the wood in production. So if the environment the woodwork is stored in before installation and during occupancy is above the recommended 45 to 65%, depending on what geographic area we're talking about, you can plan on that extra humidity absorbing into the wood and causing it to swell. If the relative humidity falls below 25%, if it's that dry, you can expect it to shrink, opening up the joints. You usually spot this problem, you know, first in wood flooring, you know, because of the gaps. So kiln drying hardwood lumber is a uh, very exact art and science. Each species in each of its uh, thicknesses needs to be carefully prepared and calculated for the correct temperature, the speed at which it can be dried, and the duration um, is all calculated for the correct temperature. 
So the species tolerance uh, accomplishes the most uniformly flat and dry pieces of lumber without warping, cracking, and cupping when dried properly. So appropriately, hardwoods are carefully measured to 6 to 8% moisture content before shipping to customers. And then we're talking about the woodwork manufacturer there. Air drying does not get it done. AWI does not recommend the use of hardwood lumber that has been harvested from the site and left to air dry for an unspecified period of time in uncontrolled conditions. This is not kiln drying. Natural wood has tension in the grain, which when dried pulls itself into the direction it naturally wants to go. Woodworkers know how to plane this to make it flat and usable. There are a lot of ways to use you know, um, this uh, material. And in some cases, there is material that turns out not to be usable. What do we do with that? You know, those usually get cut into shorter pieces that can be made into things that don't need a large expanse of a board. Um, there are three statements found in the standards that define responsibilities. And let's just take a look at those and you'll see yourself and others in these descriptions. So the first one, and you're going to find this on page three, 3.1.3a, the responsibility for dimensional change problems in wood products resulting from improper design rests with the design professional. What do we mean by that? We mean that you needed to plan in some gaps and reveals so that panels, doors, drawer fronts, et cetera, can all expand and contract without being noticeable. And we'll talk a little bit about how we do that. The responsibility for dimensional change problems in wood products resulting from improper relative humidity exposure during site storage and installation rests with the contractor. Are you noticing how there is sort of a timeline here? And the last one, responsibility for dimensional change problems in wood products resulting from humidity extremes after occupancy rests with the owner and building facility manager. So what about transition from, you know, the woodwork company to the job site prior to installation? Delivery shall be made in accordance with a progress schedule furnished by the contractor and for climate controlled applications, just as it says on page three, 3.2.1a. Think of how useful that language is going to be to you when you're explaining this to somebody. This is an expectation that follows AWI standards. So the the um, area in which the uh, woodwork is to be stored uh, shall be dry. The overhead work is completed and the area is broom clean. I'm showing you photos coming up of real life, don't do it this way scenarios. So not that, not this. Uh, for non-climate controlled interior or exterior applications in an area which is clean and protected from moisture and direct sunlight, that is what you want. Notice the multi mini greenhouses sitting in the direct sunlight on this cabinet delivery curbside situation. These deliveries should never have happened. So, you know, this is a good opportunity for somebody, maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody else on the project to determine how and where are you going to deliver this woodwork? Where is it going to be? And if somebody says, hey, we don't have room on the job site right that, for that, you know, just put it curbside, please don't do that. That is a very bad idea. What's going to happen when it rains? Look at one of those packages just has cardboard and strapping over the top of it. The rest of it is soaking up some moisture and all of that plastic run is creating a mini greenhouse and that whole thing inside of there, that's all going to fall apart. So this is a better this is a better view of what it should look like. So uh, what we do is we uh, have these additional conditions. Accept the woodwork when materials can be stored on a flat level surface at least four inches off the floor on a pallet. Yeah, sure. Uh, protected from sunlight, protected from excessive or direct heat. This is a good way to do it. So inside of our standards, you'll notice this. And this type of chart, we've had this, I think, probably in at least 
oh, I don't know, at least since the early 70s, this type of chart has been in our standards. And it changes just, you know, slightly as we go along. But get familiar with this because this all has to do with your geographic zones. So note how there's three basic areas. This indicates three basic types of climate or environments. Notice how C suggests the design professional indicates which, which zone is applicable for the product. So that says of these three zones, the design professional should designate which is applicable for the product. In the absence of a specific zone designation, the default zone shall be zone two. So get to know zone two, because if nobody says which zone it is, that's the one they're going to build toward. All right, so page four of the new standard uh, looks like this, and it has details. Now, this just shows you what is going on with um, North America, uh, but you know, our standards are used around the globe. I mean, and partly the reason for that is really that, you know, our country owns, um, you know, I think over 900 now um, OBOs, overseas building operations. And those are generally all, you know, government facilities that are maybe embassies or part of military bases, something like that. Those things are generally all designed by uh, U.S. architectural firms, and so, therefore, the specifications are based on, you know, what happens in the U.S., even though the project is going to be someplace else in the country. So, you know, we do recommend, actually, that if you're going to go outside of the U.S., you know, you need to actually, you know, probably just go a little bit further uh, looking at our cli climate zones, but then also uh, heading over here. This is, um, let me see if I can find a notation for it. So the notation for that is, you know, go to the USDA. It is interesting how as you go around from country to country, you'll often see like I think um, Kazakhstan, the uh, zone is actually the same as the um, upper Midwest of the United States. So you will find some similarities. And that's actually true of wood species as well. Sometimes um, species that are very prevalent, you know, in a certain part of the United States, they're also very prevalent in some other European or Middle Eastern countries. So it's kind of interesting what happens there. You know, so you do have a resource to go to. If you're confused by that, you know, contact probably the um, quality um compliance division of AWI, and they can help you with some of this as well. You know, they deal with this actually kind of more than anybody else at AWI. So just um, as the moisture content of the materials is verified prior to wood fabrication, the relative humidity or RH of the areas of woodwork installation will be read and documented prior to delivery, during installation, and afterwards. And that is what a woodworker in project management generally does. So the woodworker installer will alert the GC if the temperature of relative humidity is out of acceptable range for immediate adjustment. There will be a discussion. All right, acclimation is very important since 1994. AWI Architectural Woodwork Standards has recommended acclimation of wood materials into the space that they, they are going to be installed into for a minimum of 72 hours. That applies to doors as well. So why do we want to do that? That is because you want whatever the sensitivity of that particular species with its applied finish whatever that requires in order to feel comfortable in its setting, it takes about three days, you know, for that to acclimate into that new setting, then installation will be much easier because you're not going to be expecting a change along the way during installation. So in the new AWI 200 standard, the same language is used on page four, 3.2.5. So real easy to pick that out stick that in your specification that will save you a lot of confusion as you're going along. So how does this relate to the GC or the installation team? So the new installation standard at AWI is also your friend here. So this is our new AWI ANSI standard 0620 for installation and finish carpentry. Again, you can see the standard online. You don't have to buy it. It's digital. Page 4 
3.1.3 directs the user to see this recommendation in the AWI 200 standard care and storage. They should have both of these. They should have this, the standard 200. They should also have the finished carpentry and installation standard. It tells everybody where they stand. So as a specifier, you want to make sure that you reference both of these standards and it's up to the GC to actually get those. It's not a bad idea to ask them if they ever saw those and then to direct them to AWI for them to go get those. They can, just like you can see them digitally, there's no excuse to not know, you know, what's in the standard. Everybody can have it. All right, so let's go to this one. AWI highly recommends the building interior temperature to be measured and maintained. Two important words, measured and maintained. Uh, between 15.5, uh, which is 32 degrees uh, centigrade, um, or 60 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit without going outside of that range in either direction for longer than 24 hours. So we're gonna look at the negative effects of that in just a moment. Wood is a hygroscopic material and stores some moisture even after it's been kiln dried. Sealing wood materials on all sides uh, in so is uh, some protection and will slow the process of shrinking, swelling, cupping, bowing, you know, due to the expansion and contraction of that stored moisture. Ongoing monitoring is recommended, but that alone is not enough protection. The wood's dimensional stability lies in the controlled environment and that control is managed before, during, and after fabrication and delivery. Let's look at the natural enemies of wood. So the custom wood products we produce leave the woodwork plant and are delivered to the job site. Okay, now we're there. Once it's off our trucks, the responsibility lies with the general contractor to protect. So when the building gets turned over to the owner, it's all good. The building and the environment have an impact on the woodwork. Heat, humidity, temperature are on the top of the list. All right, what happens when it's too hot? What do we mean by that? How do you know when it's too hot for woodwork? Well, when things start to fail. Here's a really good example of things failing. So here we just have some you know, basic paneling. Um, they're hung on a ceiling. You have uh, edge banding around the edges of this. Why would it matter if it gets too hot in this building? Well, here's why, the part you can't see. The adhesive that holds the edge banding on uh, is going to be reactivated at 113 degrees. So if it's up at the sixth floor ceiling in a building and somebody decides, oh, for four days, nobody's going to be in this building over the 4th of July holiday, and we'll just leave you know, all of the HVAC systems off and not waste that energy. And then they come back on Tuesday morning and it's all you know, edge banding coiled up on the floor six stories below in a big heap of edge banding ribbons. That's a problem. So yeah, did it get 113 degrees up at the top of the atrium? Yeah, you bet it did. It probably was hotter than that. And so that makes the glue reactivate. And of course, nothing holds together. So it is important even during, you know, long unoccupied uh, periods, you know, say in an unoccupied, um, you know, unleased tenant space, there's a good example. Um, yeah, or, you know, long periods where, you know, an entire building is empty because everybody went on the company retreat or, you know, whatever the case may be. All of the HVAC equipment needs to continue to run if you want to protect that woodwork and keep it all together. So here's another example of what can happen. This is solid wood. Here is a um, solid maple tabletop in the model making room of an architectural firm. And you can see by looking at the span here of that uh, ruler and also the triangle that it's resting against how far out of level this got over a four day absence of HVAC controls in that building that really demonstrates why it's necessary to keep the controls on even if the people aren't there. That's over, that was an inch and an eighth out of level. And by the way, that doesn't go back once you turn it back on again. So, you know, you compress cells and then you're there, that's it. So insuff insufficient specifications often look like this. The HVAC system must be operational. What does that mean? That means when you turn on the switch, you hear the motor going, okay, 
okay, it's not measured or maintained, right? All right, it's just working. That's not enough. So in a wood frame construction of both residential and commercial buildings, especially on the coast and shorelines where every other building is registered on a national trust for historic preservation, old problems like this present a challenge. When repurposing an old building with wood frame construction, be extra vigilant about the HVAC specifications, particularly as they relate to the readiness of the building to accept the woodwork. And why do we talk about the coast? Because of the storms. You know, hurricanes, uh, power goes out, lots of moisture in the air, it's practically raining inside of the buildings. You know, you got you you have a problem there, so you need to be careful of how that is all being managed. The solid lumber wall paneling in this um, auditorium has been securely fastened at the corners and and um, at regular intervals. But you know that's not enough to stop the shrinking that is going on in this auditorium with no relativity relative humidity controls none not a single one. So every bit of this solid wood paneling is coming apart. Boy, you sure don't want that to happen to you. So AWI's new ANSI standard for finished carpentry and installation, of course, gives additional direction for these conditions. Planning in advance with the building owner, the general contractor, the specifier, the design professional, the woodwork manufacturer is a good way to determine what is needed to mitigate woodwork movement in uncontrolled RH environments. Reveal strips, you know, would have maybe prevented some of that. Um, gaps allowing for wood movement, fasteners that have some movement ability. These are all proven methods that will help to accommodate seasonal dimensional changes. So who, where do you get that information from? Probably you should be talking to a woodwork company that can recommend how they do that. All right, AWI's ANSI stand. Oh, and by the way, you know, look at the shop drawings for this kind of stuff too. Somebody should be showing on their shop drawings how they anticipate the shrinking and the swelling of the woodwork. Do you see some kind of fastener that allow for that? Do they have some bubble notes in there? You know, look to see if you don't see anything that indicates that and you're wondering where's this all gonna go when the humidity gets too much or if it gets too dry, you know, you better ask a question before they build it. You know, have the discussion. I think that is that is so problem solving. Preventive medicine happens through discussion. So ask somebody, what are we doing here to, you know, make this all stay stable? So AWI's ANSI standard um, 0620 on finished carpentry and installation guides the reader in the use of expansion joints. Um, it suggests a dimension uh, for them based on the panel length and also suggests you look for these on the shop drawings and that your shop drawings uh, review uh, checklist shows these. So let's look at relative humidity in which the biggest uh, factor in woodwork dimensional stability um, is our problem. So let's start with, you know, too wet or too moist. Uh, the room's uh, relative humidity um, is far too high. Okay. The individual pieces of flooring have swelled up past the point of being tight together and are still swelling up. It all has to go somewhere, so it's pushing up at the joints, and that is probably a little over uh, dramatized, you know. But it shows you this is what is actually happening in a cross section, so you can see what that's going to look like, and you will feel it when you walk across it or roll a chair across it. Bump, 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 bump. Yeah, it will be just like that. Here's a problem. What happened here? So. You know, this is a place where you can start to think about a little bit of math. So this this project is in Ohio. It's not over on the coast or anything. The dimensional stability of maple is 1264. What that means is in a board that's 12 inches wide and one inch thick, the board will swell up in width an additional 1264 if it goes outside of the dimensional stability range for that species. If you multiply that over the face of a 10 uh, foot area of gym floor, the floor will become an additional one and three quarter inches wide if the environment is exposed to greater than 25 to 55 percent relative humidity. That's just for 10 feet. A typical gymnasium, uh, you know, floor has a basketball court, you know, which is about 70 feet wide. Could the floor expand another 13 inches wide? Where would it go? 
this floor is so you know the picture you see here don't you think that this floor is just getting started um certainly you can't use it for anything so let's turn to page 48 and look at the far right column to compare the dimensional stability factors of the different wood species commonly used um 364s to 1464s is you know the absolute range to avoid this problem of course you want to keep the interior relative humidity at 25 to 55 percent in that zone so here you go this is what this looks like you know how do you call that back you, you do have to get the humidity out of the space but you know we're talking about a gymnasium so it's, you know it's a lot of work to you know get that down all right so what about if it's too dry so when the in interior um, environment conditions fall below the acceptable range, shrinking will occur, and that manifests itself, of course, in very visible ways that are a little bit different. So let's take a look at that. When the room is too dry, usually it's hard to keep the gaps closed, and then you will have openings. Now, depending on how things are fastened down or fastened together, there might be a number of pieces of flooring that are held close together and all of a sudden there's a large you know three-eighths gap and that's because probably the fasteners have connected more than one piece of flooring together and so they're held together but they're not necessarily held to the floor all right so here uh, what you have are um you know the gaps that have opened up because it's dried to the point where the cells are shrinking to the point of pulling in the direction of their natural material grain tension and this is really pretty extreme when you start to see things that are that far whack now here we have a different kind of problem um so uh you know what, what you see there is you see a framework that there is a panel inserted into and that often is a pretty typical construction for maybe a cabinet door um, you have the frame that goes all around the outside edge and there's a panel inserted in the groove. Now, generally, what you want to be sure to see on the shop drawings is that that panel inside is free floating. It is not glued into the framework because the glue is going to be stronger than the wood, hands down. What will happen is if that panel starts to shrink, the panel will crack because the outside edges have to stay glued to the frame. And the, the only place that it can open up is going to be in the middle of the panel, probably, or along some some weak area of the grain and you don't want that <clears throat> in another case similar type of thing it's too dry where is the crack going to develop here when they have that panel glued all the way in the framework of that drawer front it's going to go right where they drilled the holes to put the handle on because that's now the weak spot in that panel <clears throat> here's another example of the wood just literally pulling apart because it is so dry if you see that piece on the left there that should never have happened. This is actually in a residence. It's a beautiful project, but they insisted, you know, that they never did a project that they needed to do relative humidity controls on. Boy, did they ever find out that that's necessary um, in a very inconvenient way. So, you know, kind of take a look ahead of time and see what the plan is for getting that HVAC equipment you know, operating and then that the relative humidity is being measured and maintained at the proper amount for that zone. And what is the plan? Who's in charge? Who's responsible for it? Um, the owner is going to have a tough time wanting to take occupancy if this stuff is all coming apart. And there's going to be an awful lot of screaming and swearing after they take occupancy six months, 12 months down the road you know, when everybody wants to know whose fault it is that this is happening. And then the owner finds out it is actually their job to make sure that the relative humidity is maintained in their own place. All right, here's, now here's a unique situation. This is actually uh, quite a unique uh, framework that actually was put together to be sort of a door jam situation going around some uh, cased openings and also some uh, doorway openings where they kind of put a butcher block scenario together with solid lumber um, and big long glue ups and, and you know about 10 inches deep actually formed sort of a ledge appearing at the outside edge of the wall that went all around these these openings. They left absolutely no space for expansion and contraction and this thing faces a wall of windows on the south side of the building and in the winter very dry very sunny very hot um, and these things just all started to come apart 
So everybody wants to know, of course, whose fault it is. Uh, the woodworker actually took the blame for this needlessly. They should not have done that. I found out about it afterwards because they had no relative humidity controls in the building and they didn't allow any way whatsoever in the design for expansion and contraction of solid lumber. This is maple. It's going to get it's going to get bigger and it's going to shrink and it's going to do it pretty dramatically. So you have to plan some avenue for these um wood pieces to be able to do what they're naturally going to want to do in the environment that they've been placed within let's look a little bit at care and storage you know a lot of times the woodwork is delivered someplace and people just don't know how to take care of it once it's there what does the maintenance staff do what do the facility managers you know do to keep it clean and to you know keep it in good condition. So, you know, we put some information in there. You know what? It's not a bad idea to see if the woodwork company is going to include this information with their warranty, uh, you know, for their woodwork. They should be providing some care and storage information that resonates with what is listed in the standard. If you don't see anything like that, you know what? Print the page out and hand it to the facility manager. I mean, I think I've told, I don't know how many, if IFMA folks, and if you don't know what IFMA is, that's International Facility Managers Association, you know, they're the ones that are, you know, ultimately responsible for a commercial building, at least, and often hospitals, um, you know, community buildings, you know, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, as soon as you get a large building that somebody else is in charge of maintaining, they should know how to take care of the woodwork. So, uh, what we want to make sure that we do uh, is to clean it with a mild flax soap. That's a diluted flax soap. And that, of course, the only one that I can think of comes to mind is Murphy's oil soap. Um, and that is just a diluted uh, product. You put a tablespoon in a bucket of a gallon of water, I think, and you use a, a soft cloth to clean things with and immediately dry it back off again because you don't want water ever laying on the surface of wood. But the reason for that and not using any waxes or greases is if you have to touch up anything, let's say the electrician comes through and he's got, you know, big tool belt on, he makes a big scratch across this. How do you touch that up if the surface is all full of, you know, wax or silicone or some kind of greasy, you know, product? Because it's not going to stick. The, the touch-up finish will not stick to all of that um, material that has found its way into the, the surface of the wood finish. So you wanna avoid the use of cleaning products that contain ammonia because yes, they will cloud up a finish, wax, you know, any kind of grit, silicone, um, all those things are really damaging to woodwork. And I don't care if it's a molding, a stairway, an antique piece of furniture, if it's paneling, whatever, you know, you never wanna clean it with anything that, um, you know, is anything that comes out of a spray bottle, especially, um, and has greases or oils uh, or, or silicones in. <clears throat> All right, maintenance. <laughs> yeah, so here's a whole bunch of, of things that uh, are recommendations of what to do and what not to do, you know, with your woodwork. And if you look through these, they're the things that most of you probably already know. Impacting wood cells, what do we mean? Pounding on them, um, spiky, uh, you know, shoe heels, um, you know, continuously using a, a hammer or something to pound something into position. Um, avoid a concentrated high heat. You know, when you take, especially on a, a plastic laminate countertop, a lot of people don't realize this. And I see people do it all the time. They take something off the stove, they put it right on the, the countertop. That's going to expand the laminate, but it's also going to reactivate the adhesive underneath it. And it will often bubble up that uh, little area of the laminate and it will not go back down again. Um, you know, use a hot pad. Uh, in order to do that or leave things on the stove on an on uh, unused burner that isn't active. Avoid the accumulation of airborne dust. Uh, dust is often very abrasive because it picks up everything in the air, absolutely everything, um, including outside grit off of people's clothes, and that will dull the finish over time. The sustained exposure to high moisture liquids may also cause oxidation and leave a permanent stain. Um, it can also bleach out the wood. So if steam, um, you know, these uh, countertop uh, 
water boiling kettles. If you have one that's shooting steam up directly underneath a cabinet above it, you're going to have a problem with that cabinet. It's either going to make the cabinet door, if it's wood bleached out, it's going to cause some bubbling possibly. It's it's not good. The, aim, the spout should be with nothing above it and facing away from other woodwork. Uh, sustained exposure to direct sunlight will change the color of wood. We're talking about photo degradation. That is a huge problem. Yes, wood oxidizes over time. It's affected by oxygen. It's affected by sunlight. Most of the time, um, wood will oxidize darker in color over time. Uh, sunlight will fade it. If you have a picture over something or you have a door open all the time, the wood behind it will look different over time, probably in a couple of years, and it is not a reversible thing. Refinishing one little area of a wall where a picture used to be to try to make it match something, forget it. It isn't going to happen. Improper use of product for purposes other than which it was intended may degrade functionality over time. So let's look at some pictures of this. Obviously, this is the easy one. Avoid impact. If you're pounding on wood, you compress the cells. They're going to look like this forever. You're not going to bring it back unless you sand the whole thing down past that point. Avoid heat. Yes, it will leave burn marks. Um, you know, changes the ability for the uh, adhesives to continue to do their job. A dust accumulation, very gritty, wrecks every finish. I don't care what kind of finish it is. Uh, water and moisture should never lay on the surface of wood, even on the floor. You know, you see wood accumulating around windows, um, coming in through doorways, have a way to soak that all up, go wipe it up. Um, and here on the left, you'll see that picture has a little bit of uh, steam damage. That's because there's a water kettle directly below it, and that uh, wood has all bleached out and has gotten underneath the finish, so it's all cloudy. And then um, avoiding prolonged sunlight in just one place. This happens a lot. You peel back the rug and you can see what the floor used to look like before it all got um, you know, affected by sunlight and oxidation. Using doors and drawers as ladders and grab bars. Boy, more drawer fronts and drawers and cabinet doors fail because people bend down to get at something and then they use the top of the cabinet door as leverage to pull themselves back up again. Try not to do that. Um, also, I've seen this happen numerous times where somebody actually pulls out the drawers in a graduated manner and uses it as a step ladder to get up to a higher cabinet. Keep a step ladder nearby someplace perhaps a small um, alcove between cabinets where there's an opening where you can just simply pull the ladder out from the space between the cabinets so that it's right there and people stop using the drawers, uh, which will collapse under somebody's weight uh, in order to use that as a ladder. And uh, if you got questions, you know, feel free to ask, you know, the, you should know, I mean, obviously there's a reason you don't put water directly on a wood surface. Um, you know, so, you know, keep it in mind, you can make woodwork look good and last a really long time without too much um, thinking, you know, just by using some common sense on some of this stuff. But it's also really good to know where to go, you know, to get answers when you have a situation. So let's look at your questions. Does anybody have any, any questions about any of this? Uh, yeah, Margaret, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, yeah, Margaret, we've actually <clears throat> got a couple. Um, okay. Actually, already answered a couple. Uh, they came in, you know, pretty much uh, just a few minutes after we got started, and uh, you covered them not long after after that. So, uh, just uh, the first question was on the length of time required for uh, materials and woodwork and stuff to acclimate within a facility. Um, and that came through as you were talking about the, uh, the humidity zones and the, or the, the temperature and humidity zones. Um, that was, uh, am, am I correct in saying, seeing that that was uh, approximately 70, 72 hours on, right. on average? Yeah, that's, that's correct. 72 hours is the minimum. I mean, if you really have the luxury of time, which almost never happens, um, you know, 10 days is really, frankly, ideal, but that is probably not realistic in most places. But if you can get at, um, I think at the U.S. Forest Products Lab did a study on this kind of thing a number of decades ago, but if you can get a, at least um, three days, um, you're most of the way there. So, you know, shoot for that as a minimum. If you can make it longer and you have luxury of time, absolutely do that. If you can get seven, if you can get 10 days, boy, better for you. Okay. And um, just a question I've got on that and just uh, 
come coming from a construction manager standpoint and, and dealing with contractors and, and installing things and like this and facilities that 72 hours or 10 day time period that doesn't mean store it in an area that meets those conditions and then go put it in some place that doesn't right yeah they should be sitting in the area they're going to be installed in installed in. okay yeah. So yeah. if, if um, you know, you have boardroom paneling, you know, get that stuff in the boardroom area before it's installed and let it just sit in that space for a minimum of three days. You know, you'll find the installation to be much, much better um, and easier to do when that happens. And then you won't be constantly adjusting it. The, the difficulty, and I just want to lay out this scenario, what this looks like if you bring it there and start installing it that day, that stuff is not acclimating. So you, you install some of it. The next day you saw install a little bit more of it the next day you install a little bit more of it but then you go back and you look at the first day and it's really not fitting very well why because it's already it's now it's acclimating and it's installed you know and then you have to go back and you adjust okay well maybe you should have just waited instead of undoing what you just did you know there's a, there's time thrown out the window by not allowing acclimation it's better to go do something else yeah and um is it better to like when you pull something in it's maybe it's in a box maybe it's in a crate mm -hmm. is it wise to open the end of it if it's let's say it's it's wood wood flooring is it smarter to just leave it in the box or is it do you recommend you know opening the end so you know conditions can get into the product Rather yeah. than just, um, you know, because sometimes we see stuff show up in crates, sometimes we see it show up in boxes. Does it literally need to be exposed to the elements or can it just stay in how it's packaged? Yeah, best case scenario is to at least open the packaging if you can get it all out of the packaging way better because you're going to have that acclimation thoroughly take place with nothing impeding its progress. Now, the, the caveat to that, of course, is that if this is all sitting in an area where there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot going on, and the potential for damaging it while it's just sitting around, you know, then either, you know, put up some kind of barrier between it and the activity that's going on, um, or, you know, open just parts of it, you know, so that it's still protected, but one area of the packaging um, is allowing the exchange of the air conditions to get in there somehow. So you have to make the judgment as to what is happening in those three days, you know, what's going on in that space. If you can keep it away from activity, yeah, then, then fully expose it. If you're going to have a difficulty, either either barriers, you know, have to be put in place um, with some kind of warning, you know, to to steer clear of this stuff. Yeah. OK, good um, question on the um, testing for the for the moisture limits, uh, the, the picture of the uh, moisture gauge there that that does that just touch the material or does it actually penetrate into it? Yeah, so there's two different kinds of gauges. One is the gauge that's what's called a moisture meter, and that actually gets penetrated into there's two prongs that get inserted into the wood. That is used when the lumber is delivered, um, and this is panel product too. It gets delivered to the architectural woodwork firm. When it's delivered, they immediately test it with that to see what the moisture content is. Anything that's above the acceptable range goes back. It goes back to the lumber company. They don't have to accept it if it's outside of the acceptable range. Okay, so then let's just say that now uh, we're getting close to installation time. Okay, the moisture air readers are often things that a woodwork company will bring to the job site and set up in various locations where they're going to have woodwork installed. And they will go and take readings from those along the way to make sure that the uh, climate of the area where the installations are going to occur is getting under control as we're getting closer to the installation day. When they're out of control, that's when you start to see letters coming from an AWI firm saying the relative humidity, according to the standards, has to be thus. Please make it be so, you know, or we're not going to deliver it. Then there will be, you know, more testing to see if anything has happened. It could get better, it could get worse. 
I mean, one job that I I was a part of for a, a while, about 10 years ago, uh, they did not have any windows installed and they wanted the cabinets installed. And it was just pouring like a Noah's Ark situation out there. And it, it was like raining inside the building in the atrium of the building because there was nothing above it. And they wanted the woodwork installed. And, you know, they were insistent that we do this. And so, you know, we said, you know, here's what's in the standards that says why we don't do it. Here's what's going to happen if you insist we do this. And here's the thing that you're going to sign taking full responsibility for this, you know, because this isn't the woodworker's fault once this whole thing starts to unravel after it's installed. You know, we just told them you can't do that and they're doing it anyway. Well, then it's on them, isn't it? So, you know, yeah, if they want to go ahead and violate all that, you know, fine. But, you know, make sure somebody's signing off that it isn't their fault when they've been properly warned to never do it that way. So there was a project a number of years ago in Florida where the owner was very fussy about wanting to be sure it was a huge residence, like five kitchens and 89 bedrooms, and it was just giant. And they were very fussy about wanting to be sure that all of their cabinets were going to be ready the day that they needed to be installed, and they were built a year in advance. That is ridiculous, first of all, but, you know, they allowed it and the interior design firm ended up taking it on the chin because here's all these cabinets and they told them, you know, don't do this in advance. That's fine. We're going to store them all. Well, they stored them in semi-trailers sitting on the property. This is Florida. And so each one of these semi-trailers filled up with, you know, 200 degrees of heat and high humidity and, you know, they closed the door and locked them. And a year later, when they went to, you know, go take them out and install them, they were all in pieces. Every bit of it had fallen apart and they couldn't use any of it. You know, that's not a controlled environment. Well, then they blamed the woodwork company for building things that fell apart. Mm, you know, no, not so much. So, you know, it's a good idea to look where that responsibility lies and know, you know, again, this is the standard that helps protect you. If you write things in your specifications about who's responsible for what, and there's good explanations for these things, you know, every, everything should go more smoothly. And I think that leads us into our next question um, regarding, you know, noting those deficiencies of conditions or who's going to take responsibility if, if it's insisted to be done a certain way. Is, is that something normally that's just handled through normal job site correspondence or is there a, or is there like an actual, I guess, compliance form that yeah. so is, is issued by AWS or AWI that says, okay, here is a template checklist or um, something that identifies things that are out of compliance and this is acceptable, not acceptable, and a place for everybody to put their John Han Hancock and, and acknowledge. Yeah, so, so generally each architectural woodwork firm has its own warranty and that warranty is bound to various rules. And they usually have their own um, you know, documents because they're operating under their own jurisdiction with their own set of attorneys, et cetera. Um, and they have already uh, put in place their own process for how they handle that kind of thing from beginning to end. And that, that kind of information is stuff you wanna see. It still just blows my mind that somebody will say, well, I don't, we never get a warranty for the architectural woodwork. Why not? You get it for every other product, don't you? You should be getting it. And that's important because that warranty tells you where everybody stands and it should resonate with the AWI standards. And what we're talking about specifically is what you find in the 620 finished carpentry and installation standard that spells out exactly what you're just asking in your question, whose responsibility is it, who does what, right? Okay, and also the care and storage standard that we just covered. That being said, what you want to do is make sure that you're seeing something from the woodwork firm that explains what their process is. And usually this is in their um, proposal or their contract documents. So some, somehow, someplace, they're spelling out for you what they're going to do to measure that humidity in the space prior to them bringing the delivery and uh, executing an installation. Sometimes the, the woodwork company only provides it, they do not install it. So you have two different things going on there. So you might have more than one company to talk to about that, but they should have a process in place. A very typical process would be that the architectural woodwork company says, this is the day we're going to install these, this is what they are. We're going to hang them in these locations. 
um, and they lay out what rooms that they will be in. And these are the days we're going to go take the readings. Then you'll also see these are the days we took the readings and this is what the readings were. And then you start to see these are the letters that tell you these are in compliance or no, these are not in compliance and this is what you have to do to get it into compliance. And this happens between the woodworker and the construction project manager. Okay. Once things are installed, then you're talking about a facility manager or the owner of the building. Good. And I think we, and we're just about to run up against the end of the hour, and we've got one more um, concerning, it's, it's back to uh, concerning the HVAC limits. Again, just typically, um, where have you seen the requirements for the temperature conditions and the humidity conditions? Where have you seen them in project specifications as far as the operating ranges will be in place um, by then, you know, the, the contractor would be responsible for making sure that the HVAC system is operational and it's operating within the limits. Is that something that you have typically seen in division in division one? Um, a combination between the mechanical specifications, the the division six specs, and division one, because um, I I know from a construction manager standpoint, like with acoustic ceiling tiles, I need to have that building operational conditioned and ready to be able to take those things so they don't curl up on the ends and suck up all the moisture. But I don't think I have ever seen anything that it actually told me that okay. Here's your operating conditions for your for your requirement for your HVAC system for these specific components. Have you have you seen that specified anywhere? Yeah. So yeah, that's a, that is a really, really excellent and brilliant question, by the way. And I'm glad you asked that because one of the things that's kind of a rule of CSI, um, any specification writer is, you know, don't repeat yourself. You know, we don't like redundancies. And I agree with that. However, this is a place where it really does pay to repeat yourself. Um, depending on the project, and it does vary. I mean, I'm sure you've seen, you know, you have a, you know, typical residential type thing. And the specifications are just some, you know, handwritten things on the front page of the building plan, or you have, you know, seven, you know, sets of spec books that weigh, you know, 900 pounds because they detail absolutely every single thing. So it depends on the project and where you're going to see that. Here's what I have seen happen in practice is that when you have a trade that reads um, the section that applies to them and nothing else, often information is missed. So it's a good idea to put this in a couple places, and this is where I've seen it. You can put it in your general conditions. You can put it in your area of HVAC. You can put it in the woodwork um, installation um, specifications, and you can also put it if there is um, the luxury of having a specification so thorough and so complete that there are instructions for after um, occupancy. And that rarely happens, but I have seen it from time to time. This is what you're going to do once the building is occupied. There is a note there. So that is four individual places that you might see that. It's not a bad idea to have that information go over to the finished carpentry section and also repeat it in the architectural woodwork section. Now, I have also heard door people kind of argue about it should also be in the door section or it should not be in the door section. I'm gonna kind of leave that up to you, but that's another place that you might find it depending on what's included in the bid package. Are there doors or aren't there doors? Is it all doors and no woodwork? Well, you know, it's for you to kind of decide where that goes, but it is not a bad idea to repeat it because again, you don't know who is reading how far into the specs beyond the thing that pertains just exactly directly to the thing they're thinking of that day. Does that help? Absolutely. That's that's a great answer and uh, very, very helpful. Um, okay, so uh, we are a little bit over, folks. Um, so we will uh, call it a chapter meeting for December. Margaret, thank you very much. This was another another great uh, presentation. I'll always enjoy your information. It's always detailed, informative, and always brings something to light that I'm sure not a lot of people have probably uh, ran across or, or thought too much about and, and will in the future. So again, thank you for your uh, involvement and support of the chapter. Thank you for this presentation. And um, 
Everyone that's uh, still on, you will receive a short survey at the end of this. Um, so if you can fill that out and put your information in for your uh, AIA requests, um, much appreciated. And uh, everybody have a safe and happy holiday season wherever you may be. And we'll see everybody in January. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.